Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so this is the talk on Python and uh, TensorFlow. So if you're in the wrong room, get the heck out. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, you could stay anyway, if, even if you're in the wrong space. Um, so uh, originally my talk was uh, scheduled to start at 11.15 uh, and go until 12. Uh, and then after that, there's lunch and everything. So I know that everybody's like kind of uh, going to be uh, kind of chomping at the bit to go, go to lunch. Um, but, uh, and so, uh, but my, my talk was uh, changed to, uh, from 11.30 to 12. So I lost about 15 minutes. And I was about to go, and I was, gonna, I was very uh, likely to go over as it was. Uh, so uh, you're going to have to bear with me a little bit and forgive me uh, if I do go a little bit over. Uh, so my name is Ian Lewis. I'm a developer advocate on the Google Cloud Platform team uh, from uh, Tokyo, Japan. So I've been living in Tokyo for about 10 years now. Um, and I'm, uh, uh, I'm on Twitter. So if you have any questions later, you can kind of catch me up at uh, Ian M. Lewis on Twitter uh, and give, uh, you know, give me feedback on the talk or uh, ask me questions about TensorFlow or whatever you happen to uh, uh, happen to have questions or you think that I might be able to answer them or whatnot. Uh, so here's my little plug for PyCon JP. So PyCon JP is uh, the Japanese PyCon. Uh, and we've been doing this, the Japanese PyCon, since 2011. And as a good, like, as an interesting backstory, uh, PyCon JP actually started at PyCon in Singapore uh, back in 2010 because me and the other founders of PyCon JP actually came to PyCon APEC, as it was known back then. And uh, we all met afterwards and were like, we need something like this in Japan. And so that's actually how, uh, how PyCon JP got started. Uh, and so we started out as a, as a mini PyCon, uh, and then six months later actually did a real PyCon in 2011. Uh, so, um, and we've actually done a lot of work to, uh, to encourage PyCon uh, activity in Japan, uh, helping the folks get started in places like uh, Taiwan and uh, Korea. So if you have any interest in that, uh, definitely check out PyCon JP and uh, sign up and uh, come hang out with us. I'm also very interested in uh, PyCon and, or Python and Go and Kubernetes and things like that, uh, containerization, that sort of thing. So if you're interested in that, definitely check out my Twitter. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit fast because I don't have a lot of time. Uh, so uh, you're going to have to bear with me a little bit on that. Uh, but first, I want to kind of jump into the, the actual topic of my talk, which is uh, deep learning. Um, and so I'm going to do a little bit of background on deep learning and uh, talk about what deep learning is. Uh, so how many of you are you know, machine learning scientists, data scientists, that sort of thing? OK, a fair number of you. Um, so, so I'm not. So that's going to mean that you might be a little bit bored with this talk. But uh, we'll see, uh, see how it goes. Uh, hopefully, you'll get something out of it uh, as I talk about TensorFlow. So uh, as a, uh, a little bit of background into what deep learning is and what it means, uh, so deep learning is specifically talking about a, a type of machine learning, uh, specifically neural networks. Uh, and then the deep part of that comes in the deep, deep neural networks. Uh, so essentially, a neural network is a type of network where you have some inputs uh, that come into the, uh, into the network. And those are uh, connected. Uh, to nodes, which are basically uh, implemented as, as or include an activation function, uh, something that you actually do to the uh, input, uh, and then that input is then uh, ex exported out of the uh, the neural network as a uh, as an output. So in this case, we might have something like a cat picture, and so the input would be the pixels that we have uh, from the cat picture, and that goes through the neural network and outputs a say a kind of a classification of like whether it's a cat, whether it's a dog, uh, something like that. And each of these are interconnected uh, by passing around things like uh, what's called a tensor. Uh, and those values are then uh, converted into an output tensor. So here's, a, here's kind of a background into like what uh, these neural networks are good at. So what, there's two main problem, main uh, 
problems or classes of problems that uh, neural networks are good at solving. Uh, one of those is classification. So basically saying like, okay, here's my input. Which bucket does it fit in? Is this a cat picture? Is it a dog picture? Is it a per per picture of a human? Uh, that sort of thing. So this is good for like adding things like labels uh, and putting things in buckets, etc. cetera. Uh, another type of problem is regression. So regression is basically creating a type of mathematical function that describes the data. So you get more of a range type of, uh, of output. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about classification than, uh, than regression, but uh, you can imagine that you have some sort of uh, classification problem like this one here. Uh, this is a little bit small. See if I can blow this up. Um, but say you have some data like uh, that, like you have on this graph over here. So you have some uh, some of this blue data and this this uh, orange data, and you can think of this as maybe something like the height versus the weight of a person. Uh, and then these blue and orange dots are the groupings of say adults and children. And you want to create a a network or a, a program that be, is able to differentiate between uh, children and adults based on their height and weight. Uh, so this is a really easy problem to solve. I mean, you can just draw a line between these two and you're done. Uh, but um, these are this, this is kind of an example of a classification problem that you might want to solve with a uh, neural network. But say you have something that's a little bit more complex. So you have something that looks like, like this where the data, it's not exactly clear based on the, uh, the, uh, the input data what type of function or what type of uh, grouping or, uh, or method that you should use to in, in order to group or classify the data. So in this case, if you had a very simple type of uh, neural network, this would not actually converge. It would not actually figure out, it would not be able to figure out how to solve this problem of classifying these two types of uh, data. So in order to do that, you need to be able to develop uh, a more complicated type of network. Um, so something that's a little bit deeper. So these type of networks, you can uh, add these in in intermediate hidden layers, which, add, uh, which allow you to do more complex uh, uh, recognition and classification with a, with a neural network. So, this one may or may not converge depending on how I've set this up. Uh, but essentially what you'll, in order to be able to kind of solve these types of problems, uh, you need to be able to have a, a much more uh, complex neural network. Okay. So uh, what exactly is a neural network uh, in its, at its core? So a neural network at its core is essentially a, a big function that takes in a tensor uh, and then uh, outputs another tensor that is your output. Uh, and so in the intermediate steps, what it does is it actually does these operations on the tensor in order to um, produce the output. And generally, these are types of things like uh, how many people know what like matrix multiplication is? How many people are familiar with that. It's fair, it's like kind of high school-ish math, maybe. Uh, so those types of, uh, you would do those types of operations on these tensors uh, by multiplying weights and adding biases and things like that uh, in a kind of a pipeline scenario where you do these, this over and over again in order to produce the output. And then the intermediate weights that you're actually using to do these multiplications are actually what makes up or, or uh, makes up your neural network. So I mentioned tensors. Uh, so that's the, that gives the name of uh, to TensorFlow itself. So TensorFlow is the, uh, is the idea is how it, the tensors flow through the neural network. But what is a tensor? Um, so you all are pretty familiar with matrix multiplication or ma with matrices. Um, but so something like, say, a vector or would be you know, a, uh, a simple array, how you it would implement that in a programming language. So you have a, a simple array of a, a bunch of values. And then a matrix might be uh, you know, a two-dimensional or three-dimensional version of a, uh, of a vector. So you have something like, like this, where you have a three-dimensional array uh, in your programming language. 
So a tensor is essentially an arbitrary type of matrix. So it's an arbitrary number of dimensions. Uh, so you essentially have this arbitrary, uh, arbitrarily large number of dimensions uh, making up an, uh, implemented as an array in your uh, application. So this is essentially what a tensor is. And then you can do the exact types of matrix multiplication uh, on tensors as long as the, uh, um, the number of dimensions kind of match up. So as a way of actually uh, implementing these, uh, these neural networks, um, typically, what, uh, typically neural networks are uh, fully connected networks, uh, what are called fully connected networks in the sense that each of the inputs input values is connected to an output value uh, in the output, uh, the output tensor. And so what that means is that each of these connections uh, is, has a weight associated with it. So what you're essentially doing is either uh, you may be doing like an addition or a, or a multiplication, but you're basically taking the input uh, of the, uh, into the neural network. You're doing a multiplication on the weights and then adding some biases at the end here. This is a very uh, simple example, but um, you essentially add these biases, and then that produces an output vector that says, say like here, we have three output values. Uh, this might be like three different categories for say like dog, cat, and person uh, for an input image. And then those, might, those output values would be kind of a percentage or a, an output value that, in, that indicates how well the, the input uh, image uh, matches a particular category. So that particular value uh, is not gonna be a very uh, human friendly number. It'll just be a number that uh, indicates a particular value, how much evidence you have for that this uh, picture is a human or a dog or a cat. Uh, so just looking at the number, it won't really tell you very much. Uh, so what you end up doing usually uh, with these types of uh, neural networks is you apply a softmax function at the end. And so what softmax does is it basically picks out the, uh, the maximum or normalizes all of the data so that uh, you get an output value that's between 1 and 0. And so that tells you that uh, you have, it g basically gives you a percentage that uh, this image is a cat or a dog or a person, right? So you get like, you know, that I'm, you know, 85% sure that a picture of me would be a person, right? Uh, that would be pretty low, but uh, you essentially get the idea, right? So one of the things that's really cool about neural networks is that you can, uh, you don't actually need to know very much about the data to, the, to begin with. You can basically start training a model on the, uh, on the data and then use a method called backpropagation to actually uh, Train, continue to train the model and update these weights and biases uh, in order to uh, make the model perform better. Uh, so this is done through, uh, like I mentioned, a, a method called backpropagation, where you actually provide the, uh, the neural network with a, what's called a loss function or a cost function that says, uh, takes the difference between an expected value and the actual value that came out of the neural network. So say, if uh, the, you, the, if the picture of me should be a person, that the expected value is that it's 100% that this, this person is, this is a picture of a person. Uh, whereas the neural network might produce something that says it's 85% uh, sure that it's a person. And so you apply this cost function, you get the difference out, which is 15%, and you use that 15% to then update the weights and biases uh, for that uh, neural network to make it closer to the expected output. And you do this over and over and over and over again, and eventually you get a value or, of weights and biases that uh, give you good output depending on or for a large number of inputs. And you do that by giving it uh, some training data. So here we have training data that, is, that says uh, this is an image and this is the, the actual uh, correct uh, labels or uh, the correct um, values that you should get out of the uh, neural network. <coughs> okay, so that's a little bit of background into neural networks. Uh, I've already used half my time just to get through that. Uh, but uh, why are we even talking about this? Uh, so the reason we're talking about this is because of a number of breakthroughs in, 
um, in uh, machine learning. Yes. Yes. So you need to have some training data, some data that is, uh, the, the question is like how do you uh, actually train the model and how do you know what the, the values that are, that are expected are. Uh, so you need to have some training data that, that exists already that matches that stuff, uh, those, those uh, expected values and the data together. Yeah. So the, um, so the reason why we're talking about machine learning and be why machine learning has become a very, like kind of a buzzword in recent times is because of a, uh, a number of breakthroughs in machine learning uh, that allow us to get a, uh, use machine learning to solve problems in a, uh, in a human, uh, in an actually useful way, right? So up until like fairly recently, we could use machine learning for certain types of problems uh, to help humans along and do things, but there wasn't really, uh, you couldn't actually put it into products and make them really like nice to use and, and user friendly and things like that. Uh, so this is um, a picture of the inception model that we use at Google uh, for uh, training images and applying labels to those images. Uh, so this is a, um, uh, so I'm going to start by giving a little bit more background into this, but this is a, uh, a, a large neural, deep neural network. So the, the idea of the neural networks that I mentioned earlier are that you have all of these matrix multiplications, but essentially you get, by having a very deep neural network like this, you add the deep, uh, the, the, the deep keyword or the deep uh, aspects to these neural networks. And so you can imagine that each one of these is a kind of matrix multiplication or whatnot uh, to uh, apply uh, operations onto the data. And then the images that are coming into this might be a you know, one megabyte image or, or something like that. Uh, so you can imagine that each one of those has a, an image that's translated into a tensor. And each of those pixels in say a, a megabyte size image you know, might have thousands and thousands of pixels which makes up thousands and thousands of dimensions in your tensor. And then you're going to do these thousands and thousands of, uh, take this tensor and do thousands and thousands of multiplications on all the values in the tensor over and over and over again, just to do one pass through this. So you can imagine that this is a huge combinatorial problem uh, for how much uh, actual computation needs to be done in order to train uh, the model. So you do this one time for one image and you might have millions and millions of images that you need to train. And then you need to train that thousands and thousands or tens of thousands or even millions of times. So you can imagine that this is a huge, huge problem. And so uh, what we find is as we uh, kind of build these kind of deep neural networks that uh, as you, the, the more complex and deep that you can make this, uh, the, uh, the much, you get much, much better value out of it, out of the, uh, the output of these neural networks. So for the amount of data, if you have a large ne deep neural network, you can get a lot more value out of the same amount of data by having a deeper neural network. And, but the problem with deep neural networks is that they require a lot more computation. So what people usually do is they actually build these uh, huge, huge matrix, uh, or these, uh, big machines with lots of GPUs in them, and then they use those to train their models. And they take weeks and hours, or hours, weeks, or days, or, you know, to actually train a, a single model just to do a single test to make sure that their, their particular model, or uh, their particular uh, neural network uh, works or is performant. Uh, so, and generally researchers will have to do this over and over and over and over and over again in order to uh, actually produce a usable model. So people have started using things like supercomputers uh, for these types of uh, trainings uh, in order to make them go faster. Um, but this is something that's not really available to most people. You have to lease a supercomputer uh, ahead of time. And uh, so just the, as a poll, how many people in this room have access to a supercomputer? Somebody might actually have one. Yes, that's great. You can do this stuff, maybe. <laughs> but... but 
for the rest of us that don't have access to supercomputers, you can, uh, that's actually the first time that anybody's ever raised their hand to that question. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, so people don't really have uh, access to these supercomputers to uh, be able to develop uh, these type of machine learning models and uh, actually take advantage of deep neural networks. So at Google, we do have a lot of uh, computers. We don't have supercomputers laying around. Uh, but we do have a lot of computers, and so we've approached the problem a little bit differently. Um, but we have been able to make a lot of great breakthroughs in how we do machine learning at Google. Uh, so uh, one of those, are, these are kind of evidence in some of the products that we've created. So like, uh, if you're familiar with Google Photos, uh, you can add a bunch of photos to your, to your collection of photos, and then you can search the photos uh, for keywords. So say things like statue, wedding, uh, you know, any type of keyword, and you will get back photos that match that particular key, that particular tag or keyword. Uh, and you don't have to tag these ahead of time. You don't have to teach it what things are, what, what the images are. It already kind of knows these based on our own pre-trained models. So this is something that's very, very pow powerful for, uh, for building products and building actual real world applications. So another one of the things that we've been doing is to identify text in pictures. So we have a lot of Street View data, as you might imagine, uh, or Street View images, and we want to be able to get the names of uh, the shops and things like that that are, that are out there in the real world. And so we need to like, be able to look at all of these images and get the text out of those images uh, in order to kind of index it and figure out where the shops are. Uh, so we've been working on problems like that. Uh, also, you might have heard of the AlphaGo uh, project, which uh, is a a machine learning uh, neural network that um, will play Go and is actually pretty good, good uh, as I've uh, I heard. I don't know. Uh, so we've been using a lot more uh, uh, machine learning at Google, and so this is this is a fairly relatively recent phenomenon. So, like you can notice here in this graph, like up until 2014, there was kind of moderate growth in how many projects at Google were using machine learning. But then after 2014, you have this big hockey stick kind of graph that says, like, hey, this is how many, you know, that shows you how fast machine learning has been taking off in recent years. And the, uh, this is part of a project at Google called Google Brain, uh, which uh, is to build these kind of neural networks. And the reason we're able to do that is by distributing the problems of neural networks uh, into over multiple machines. Uh, and then being able to train and uh, do prediction using many, many machines at the same time. Uh, and so this has uh, allowed us to get things like 40x speedups with, uh, with using ImageNet uh, on our reception model, which I showed you that the big graph earlier. Uh, ImageNet is a very uh, um, famous kind of uh, um, uh, data set uh, for machine learning or for training. Uh, and then we've also, we also use it for uh, Rank Brain, which is uh, the, uh, the machine learning model that we use to uh, kind of rank uh, search results. So we've we use things like on the order of 500 nodes, like 50 to 500 nodes of machines to do like training on these types of models. So this is how we get to, to TensorFlow. So TensorFlow is a library that we developed at Google uh, in order to help with building these types of distributed uh, um, machine learning models. So TensorFlow is a is an open source library that's uh, that's a, it's a Python library, uh, which is a a uh, general machine learning library uh, that you can use to build le uh, neural networks. Uh, we open sourced it last year in November, um, and it's used uh, by many of our production um, uh, machine learning projects. So TensorFlow gets its name from the idea that I mentioned earlier of having tensors that you uh, run into through a pipeline. So you have this data, a data flow of tensors uh, running through the neural network. And so that's how we got the name of TensorFlow. Um, so it gets the idea from this flow graph uh, that you create uh, for these tensors. So it does... Uh, a lot of, has a lot of really cool features like uh, this kind of like flexible intuitive construction of the uh, of the graphs um, supports for things like threads and queues and asynchronous computation um, and you can train 
uh, on CPUs or GPUs or whatever particular devices that uh, TensorFlow supports. Uh, so it basically will take the uh, operations in the graph and be able to break those up and distribute them a bunch of a bunch of different GPUs and CPUs. So some core TensorFlow data structures are the graph itself. Uh, then you have the operations, which are the nodes in the graph, and the tensors are the values that are being passed around between the operations. Then you have these other uh, types of pieces, which are like constants. So constants are things that don't change uh, as you're doing training. These are things you can change like in between training runs or in between um, as you're kind of updating your models, but it doesn't actually change as you're training uh, a single, uh, through a single run. So things like placeholders and variables are things like uh, placeholder is kind of like an input into your uh, neural network, and a variable is something that can be updated as you're training uh, the neural network. So generally what you have is these placeholders, which are like kind of input values into your uh, neural network, and then you have variables, which are things like the weights and the biases that you have uh, that are being updated uh, as you're going through the training. And then session is, the, is kind of an uh, object that encapsulates the, uh, the, the environment that you're running in. So this is the kind of thing that will map operations to a device and things like that. And then this is just a slide that says, like, lists, like, gives a non-exclusive uh, list of all of the operations uh, that TensorFlow supports. So we have a number of operations in, uh, built in that TensorFlow is supporting. So uh, I wanted to run through a little bit about how that uh, you might actually use TensorFlow. Um, let's see. So I have this uh, Jupyter uh, um, notebook that I would like to show here. Let's see. So here's like kind of an example. Let me restart the kernel and kind of clear the output here. Um, so this is kind of an example using uh, TensorFlow in a uh, Jupyter notebook. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to run through the, a really basic MNIST example. So MNIST is a, uh, a classic kind of data set for, used for machine learning, which has a bunch of images of handwritten numbers. And so what you're going to be doing is taking those numbers and then doing OCR or character recognition to uh, decide whether that, what that image, uh, what number that image represents. So if it's a one, you want to be able to output an actual text one uh, out of the output. So here uh, I'm just going to be uh, uh, loading the uh, test data. So here I have like a test and a training data set. And so the training images are basically a, a 55,000 images. Uh, and each one of those is a, uh, is represented or mapped into a tensor uh, that is 784 dimensions uh, big. Uh, so the, each of those images has 784 pixels in it. I think that's like 27, 27 by 27 or something like that. And so uh, you have a, uh, this shape of your input data, which is 55,000 characters big, and each one of those is 784 uh, dimensions large. And so here's just a sample image. I'm just pulling out the, uh, the image. Oh, it's a 28 by 28, sorry. Uh, so uh, I'm just pulling out a single image. Like this is the, uh, the, you know, the sixth uh, image in the uh, training data set. Uh, so here's what the actual output looks like. So this is just a NumPy array, uh, which represents the, uh, the, uh, the, the training um, tensor that I'm gonna be inputting. And then if you actually map, uh, let's see, this is taking a while to run actually, but uh, this is actually just gonna show me, show you the image itself, but it's taking its sweet time. There it is. Uh, so it's actually, this is actually a, uh, an image of an eight. Uh, so you can see that if you look in the actual input image, uh, each of these values in the input image represents a particular pixel in the image, and it's basically from zero to one as to how dark the image is. So uh, if it's a zero, it's a it's white pixel. If it's a near one or one, it's a uh, dark pixel. And then uh, 
as we go down here, we can see the uh, this is the training data, and so this is the the shape of the uh, the output of the training data. So this is just basically a ten uh, dimension or ten size uh, large uh, array, uh, and that is going to be uh, the output, which is a um, basically a zero one or the actually the um, the training data is either going to be a zero one or e in each of these values. Um, so that's what's called a, uh, a hot, a, I forget, it's a, it's a uh, hot one vector, uh, which is basically that there's only one uh, item in the vector that is a one and all the rest are zeros. Uh, so this actually like gives you an indication of what the, uh, what the, the, the training data represents. So this is the actual training uh, labels for the input image, which is an eight. So you can see that like in the uh, the ninth, what is it, the eighth, zero, because there's a zero, uh, in the eighth uh, position there's a one, which says that, hey, this, this image is an eight. And we're gonna use that to uh, actually train our neural network. So this is that image I showed before. And so this is like, as you're training the neural network, it's going to look at each of these pixels and assign a weight to uh, a particular pixel. Because I'm only gonna be doing a fairly shallow neural network. So this is just one, uh, one hidden layer. Uh, so this is actually going to uh, assign a weight to individual pixels uh, as to how, whether this, uh, that pixel uh, or that image represents a particular number. So here you have the blue, uh, which indicates a, a positive weight, and a uh, red, which indicates a negative weight. And so if you see like pixels in these blue areas, then that uh, generally will uh, indicate that it's a zero. And the same thing for a one or a two, and you can see that this actually kind of like maps a little bit. Uh, in this particular example, will map a little bit to an actual to the way an actual number uh, looks. So here you can see that the eight kind of looks like an eight. And then once you're done that, you can uh, kind of set up the. Um, the neural network, how you're going to actually train it. So this is the uh, actually defining the neural network itself. So here what I'm doing is I'm creating a placeholder, this X. So that's actually our input uh, to our uh, neural network. Uh, so, uh, so X is the input, and you define the shape as being 784 uh, dimensions big, and none, which is like, which basically means that it doesn't have to be 55,000 uh, size. It could be any, any size. And then uh, you assign these, these uh, other variables, so the weights and the biases, uh, which will be updated as we're going to be training. And then here I'm going to define the, uh, the actual um, uh, operations I'm going to be doing on the, uh, the values. So here I'm going to be doing a matrix multiplication. Uh, so this is one of the, defined, the predefined uh, types of uh, operations that I can do. Uh, so I'm going to be multiplying x by w uh, and that's going to multiply all the weights. So that's basically doing this uh, operation right here, this matrix multiplication. And then at the end, I'm going to be adding this B at the end, which is going to be able add the biases. And then after that, I'm going to be doing this uh, running softmax on it, which is the, uh, the final softmax to get the output. And so this gives me an actual training uh, or an actual uh, neural network that I can then use to train. So now I'm going to define the training step. So the training step defines the, the kind of back propagation uh, that I'm going to be doing on the neural network. So here uh, I'm defining a placeholder, which is y. This is, the, uh, this is for the um, loss function. And so I'm going to be using, in this particular example, I'm going to be using cross entropy, uh, which is a type of loss function that you can use. There are several others that you could try. Um, uh, but um, that's a very simple example. And then I'm going to be using gradient descent optimizer, which is, this is an actual uh, way of optimizing how I uh, update the weights and biases. Uh, so essentially, when you get the difference, you can then use gradient descent to figure out how you should update the, the weights and biases, how much you should actually update them by. And so essentially what you're using is this kind of optimizer in order to um, try to uh, take say a difference in the uh, the output and then map that to a difference in the uh, the weights and the biases that you need to make to update the value and so this is going to uh, tell me how to minimize my cross entropy function 
And so if you have a visualization of how that looks like, you have something like this, where you have these uh, an initial value and you use the gradient descent optimizer to kind of figure out which direction you should move, you should nudge these values in order to get a better output. Uh, and so you kind of do this over and over and over again in order to get a better value. Uh, this does have a little bit of, uh, of problems with finding local minima and things like that, uh, but it's, it's a pretty good uh, basic way of, uh, of nudging your values around. So next I'm going to use the, uh, the um, optimization or the backpropagation as well as my neural network, my trained neural network, in order to actually train it. Oh my god. Ah uh, yes, I missed, this, missed executing this step here. Uh, so this, uh, this is going to initialize my session, which is actually going to uh, initialize the training session for TensorFlow. Uh, and then it's going to loop and do mini batch training over uh, a group uh, over a thousand uh, or a batch of data a thousand times. Uh, so here, what I'm doing is I'm taking the training set and then I'm doing picking a next batch of a, of a hundred values. And so what's really interesting about this is uh, that I don't have to loop over the entire training set of 55,000 images and train those every single time. I can take a random set of a hundred of those values uh, and train only that in each mini batch, which is really interesting because if you're kind of a person that, that enjoys statistics, uh, this is, you're essentially taking a population, which is your training set, and then picking a random test or a random, taking a random sample uh, of that training set and then training on that, which will give you kind of a representative example or a representative sample of your, tra of your training set. Uh, and essentially what that does is gives you a, uh, almost the same results, uh, um, statistically speaking, um, that you would get if you trained on the entire population. So this is the same type of idea that you would get if you were like polling everybody to see uh, whether they liked one presidential candidate versus the other. You don't have to ask everybody in the United States, you could, uh, or everybody in a particular country, uh, you, ha you can answer, ask just a random sa sample of them and still get uh, something close to the actual results. So this saves a lot, a lot of time. You don't have to, this is like, what is it? Like a fifth of a, of a percent of the actual data that you have to run through every time. So that saves a lot of time. So next, uh, I can actually test this to see like how good my, my neural network is. So here, um, what I'm doing is I'm uh, using equal, this is another type of operation that you can use in TensorFlow, uh, and then I'm applying argmax to it. So this is going to, um, I'm uh, applying argmax to the values. So this y value is the value that I get out of, the, out of my uh, neural network. And then this y prime is the one that I get, which is the actual value. This is the, uh, the value from my training set, uh, which is the correct value. So what I'm going to do is apply argmax to both of those, which, tells, which gives me basically a 0 or a 1 in each, in each uh, vector in the outputs. So from the neural network, I'm going to get between a 0 and a 1. Uh, but what argmax does is just finds the maximum value, changes that to a 1, and changes all of the others to a 0. And then I can actually compare them. And then what we're going to do is actually uh, do uh, check the accuracy. So I'm going to find the, uh, the average uh, of all of the, uh, the correct predictions. So if, I'm do it, if I do a prediction of all of them, uh, then I can take the average of whether that was a 0 or 1 uh, equal or not. Uh, and then I'll get back, that gives me the actual accuracy. And then I can run that in a session as well. And I get back that I have a neural network that is 91% accurate. And this is actually really, really bad. Uh, one in uh, 10 images is uh, incorrect. But uh, this is a very, very simple example. You can get, uh, start doing much more complicated examples uh, uh, using MNIST, and I think the, uh, the state of the art for MNIST is something like 99.997% accurate or something like that. Uh, so you can get very, very accurate if you, if you just do a little bit more uh, with the neural network. And one of the cool things is that the TensorFlow website uh, oops, has a lot of uh, these kind of tutorials on how to do this. So this particular example is this MNIST for beginners. So this is how to do a, uh, 
uh, use the MNIST training set uh, with TensorFlow. But then if you want to do something more complicated to get better results, you can try the next uh, tutorial, which is Deep MNIST for, for Experts. Uh, so this, is, this adds a little bit more complexity to the, uh, the original neural network in order to get uh, something like 5 or 6% more accurate. And then there's a, quite a few other ones. So like using, doing things like convolutional neural networks, uh, recurrent neural networks, uh, and, and so on. So there's quite a few examples, which is uh, kind of puts that are very easy to go through, which is puts uh, makes uh, TensorFlow a very uh, attractive library for doing uh, for doing machine learning. And uh, just just for funsies, I kind of went through and uh, did a the exact same training data for MNIST uh, with the Theano library, and Theano is very very similar to the way that TensorFlow is is developed. Uh, so this is very, uh, or how you would use TensorFlow. Um, the, and so if you go through here, you can actually see I'm using the, the input, the exact same input data from the TensorFlow examples. Um, but, and you do very something very, very similar. In Theano, you have something called a shared object, uh, which you use for the weights and the biases rather than something called a variable. Um, but then you can define uh, that the neural network using the same type of softmax uh, dot matrix or dot multiplication uh, and the adding the biases. And then uh, define the same sort of cross entropy for our, uh, for our loss function as well as the training step. So one thing that's a little bit different is that uh, you have to do the um, the kind of cross pro the, uh, the back propagation a little bit yourself uh, so this is the, the actual doing of the, uh, the back propagation here. Um, you do get a built-in gradient descent uh, function here that you can use uh, by giving it the cost function of cross entropy and the weights and biases. Uh, but then you have to actually apply the, uh, the update yourself here. Um, and then once you do that, you can build a training model uh, using Theano. And then do uh, a thousand times of money batch training and then do a test here. So in this particular one, I got 89% accurate. Um, but you essentially get out about the same uh, amount of accuracy because it's the same types of operations that you're doing. Um, the main difference between something like Theano and uh, TensorFlow is in the way that the core part of the library is built. Uh, so TensorFlow allows you to break up the operations much easier and map those, devi map those to specific devices, um, whereas uh, Theano Theano's uh, input uh, is, uh, or core library, makes it a little bit more difficult to, uh, or pretty much uh, impossible to map to multiple GPUs or multiple uh, devices uh, for training. So I'm going to kind of skip ahead a little bit. Uh, so one of the things that uh, makes TensorFlow different is its distributed training. Uh, so that uh, allows you to kind of map to individual GPUs and CPUs um, and uh, supports a, a lot of different types of distributed training like, uh, you know, um, the, the data parallelization or model parallelization, uh, things like that. Um, so there's a little bit of a trade-off between things like data parallelism and model parallelism, which allows you to uh, get kind of different results for how you parallelize the, uh, the data. Model parallelism is essentially uh, breaking up different parts of the model uh, and then uh, training on the same data as part of the, in the, uh, um, in different, on different devices or different machines. Uh, and then uh, data parallelism is essentially running the same model on multiple machines, but splitting up the data. Uh, that way. And so each of those has like a little bit different, uh, you know, uh, uh, good parts and bad parts. Uh, and so um, what at Google, we tend to like focus on data parallelism, but, uh, but model parallelism works for a lot of different types of uh, things and TensorFlow supports both. Uh, so I won't really get into the uh, details of things like data parallelism and the uh, what uh, synchronous and asynchronous models are. If you're interested in that, I can talk with you a little bit later. 
Um, but one of the problems that you have when you actually have a uh, um, when you try to distribute these types of uh, these type of uh, machine learning models or these machine learning uh, uh, trainings is by is that uh, in between the individual machines you have to tr transfer quite a lot of data uh, depending on how you're uh, actually um, breaking up the uh, or distributing the uh, the training uh, so you basically need to have a, a fast network so because the uh, the operations take many uh, take things like nanoseconds on individual GPUs uh, but transferring data over the network takes on the order of milliseconds uh, you have there's like orders of magnitude differences um, in how uh, you uh, in the ability to uh, distribute the uh, the data and so the problem is that you bottleneck on the uh, the networking between the machines and so at Google we've kind of we've worked on this uh, in order to make the, uh, the the connections between the machines as fast as possible so uh, we are uh, planning on building a uh, a cloud version of this called Cloud ML, which is which supports uh, running TensorFlow graphs in a uh, in Google data centers. Uh, so this allows you to take advantage of the hardware that's uh, in Google data centers in order to uh, run uh, distributed training. Uh, so this uh, will help you uh, to reduce things that would take say eight at hours uh, to 32 minutes. Uh, on 20 nodes. So that's about 15 times faster. Uh, so a, as well as being able to uh, utilize the uh, things like GPUs and uh, um, those types of hardware. Um, we're also developing um, our own uh, hardware for machine learning and matrix multiplications. Uh, and so uh, once we're, we're calling these tensor processing units uh, and these are a type of ASIC that we have developed uh, ourselves at Google in order to uh, get better performance per, uh, per watt. So a GPU is very power hungry. Uh, so we've developed something that's a, a little bit less power hungry. Uh, but these are specifically geared towards uh, machine learning. And uh, so we're also planning on making these, using these as, uh, as, a, uh, as part of our cloud machine learning uh, offering. So that's all I had for, for the, this uh, um, presentation. I know that you all are hungry. Um, I'm very sorry about running over, but uh, if, you're very, if you're interested in TensorFlow, uh, please check out the website uh, and take a look at the, the examples. There's quite a lot of examples um, and tutorials. Um, and I think that that uh, is also one of the defining things of TensorFlow is that the tutorials are very, very good and well-written uh, and they're very approachable. Um, also, check out this uh, bit.ly uh, slash TensorFlow hyphen workshop. This is a really uh, good workshop on uh, building uh, this TensorFlow model. It goes through the uh, basic MNIST example as well as the more advanced MNIST example, as well as getting into how to distribute it uh, using Kubernetes and uh, use TensorFlow serving to like kind of build a production version of a uh, machine learning service. Uh, so definitely check that out as well. Um, if you're interested. Uh, so thanks a lot and thanks for coming. I know that you're all hungry. So uh, those of you that are too hungry to stay around for, for questions uh, can go. Uh, but if you do have any questions, I can try to take those right now. All right. Thank you again. Yeah.